All right, now, here we go. Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm your host. My friends call me Rasta Jeff. This is episode 786 of the Grow From Your Heart podcast. In this episode, I'm going to answer some listener emails. Before we get to that part of the show, let's do a few shout outs to a few of the great folks who continue to support the show on Patreon. Let's kick it off with a big Grow From Your Heart podcast thank you shout out to Dreadlock Farmer. Let's send a fist bump and a thank you shout out to Canna Fugget and Grow Dad. Let's send a big fist bump to Simeon and ADHD Grower. Let's send a big thank you shout out to a longtime supporter, our friend Nomi by My Guacamole. Let's send a fist bump and a thank you shout out to Larf Knight Rises and Noah Ann. Want to send a big thank you shout out to Kip. Let's send a thank you shout out to You Betcha. Let's send a fist bump to a longtime supporter, our friend Jeff O. Then let's wrap it all up with a big Grow From Your Heart podcast thank you shout out to Levity Love Day. Big thanks and big shout out to everybody who continues to support the show on Patreon. If you are not already supporting the show and you would like to learn how to do so, all you have to do is visit www.patreon.com forward slash grow from your heart. All of the information you need will be right there on the screen. And you know, I do include a link in the show notes and in the video description to make it super easy for all of my friends to support the podcast. In the last episode, I did talk about doing a seed giveaway. That's right, our friends at SeedsHereNow.com are sponsoring a seed giveaway. The winner of the seed giveaway on the last episode was our friend Zach Voss. Congratulations to Zach Voss. All you've got to do, my friend, is send me an email. Let me know which package of seeds you are hoping for. If I've got those seeds in stock, I will send them to you. However, not everything is available and in stock, so you may get a surprise package. You may get some extra packs. You never know what I may do. But Zach, please do send me an email. The email address, of course, is grow from your heart at hotmail.com. If you did not win that free pack of seeds on this episode, do not be discouraged because guess what? We're going to give away another pack of seeds toward the end of the show. So that's right. Stay tuned. Keep listening because seedsherenow.com and iRegenetics have teamed up to give away another pack of seeds on this podcast. All right. I don't want to ramble too far. It seems like I get really good at that. I've got a lot to cover. Let's jump into the email portion of today's podcast. The first episode on today's podcast came from our friend who would like to be referred to as Soul Train. Big shout out to my friend Soul Train. The message goes just like this. It says, yo Rasta Jeff, if you should happen to reference on this show, please refer to me as Soul Train. What's up Soul Train? Thank you for all the support, my dude. The message continues. It says, I am working my way through all of your older podcasts and I just listened to episode number 580. That's a lot of catching up to do. Thanks for listening to all the old episodes. You guys, Uh, People keep asking me for more content, new content, multiple podcasts a week. It's hard for me to do that right now with my uh, my work and living and my whole life situation. Uh, One podcast is a week a week is what I can do. But there are a lot of older episodes that you can go back and listen to. There are many, many episodes. There are uh, apparently 785 episodes before this one that you can go back and listen to. Unfortunately, YouTube has taken down a few of those. If I show plants in the videos, YouTube likes to take down those videos. So there's a video where I cut clones that they took down. There's a video about popping and twisting and lollipopping that they've taken down. Uh, They've taken down a lot of the videos where I do any sort of consumption, but YouTube takes some down. Other than YouTube taking them down, most of the videos are still up and available, uh, 785 other videos. Uh, The first 20 videos, uh, the podcast was called something different. It was called I Grow Culture for a little while for 20 episodes. Then I was informed politely and gently with the uh, by the form of a cease and desist letter that I Grow Culture was already something being used and I could not use that. So we promptly changed the name to the Grow From Your Heart podcast. My point is those first 20 episodes are shared in a playlist on the Grow From Your Heart podcast on YouTube. If you go to my playlist, you can find those. Or if you search I Grow Culture podcast, those first 20 episodes do come up. So 780-ish episodes are available of this show. So you guys, if you haven't had enough of this rambling of this beautiful face of this amazing voice, uh, please go back and listen to those previous episodes. Our friend here, uh, Soul Train, just listened to number 580, and they say, in that podcast, you answered a listener question concerning purple petioles, and you mentioned uh, if the plant is also showing crispy leaves, it is likely too much light. Yes, uh, that from what I've read in the rest of your email, that is definitely the case of what's going on here. So let me just keep going. It says, you will be pleased that the least affected strains in the grow are the machine and the blue pill, with the blue pill being far, by far the happiest looking plant in the tent. It goes on though, it says, well, I'm only in my first indoor grow with several different strains and about half of the plants have purple petioles and all of them now are getting some crispy looking leaves with this being worse on the more purple petiole 
plants. So the plants that have the more purple petioles are showing the purple crispy problem. I'm just trying to put a bunch of peas into a sense to be silly there. We get what's going on here. It says, however, at six weeks into 12-12, the buds on all of the plants are looking good. So this, you just keep uh, solidifying the idea that yes, the light is too intense is what's going on here. It says, I am growing in a five by five tent with an HLG Scorpion Diablo light. I'm not super familiar with that light. I have heard a lot about it. I know that HLG makes great shit. I know a lot of people run that light. I know that it is quite powerful. It says, I had the light set 16 inches over the canopy at 50% intensity and things were getting crispy. About 10 days ago, I lifted the light to 26 inches over the canopy at 50% intensity and the plants sure do look happier. So we are giving supporting statements, supporting evidence that this is probably a light issue. You've got that light a little bit too close, uh, maybe turned up too high. Uh, you did the right thing. You raised that plant. Uh, when you get those new LED lights, I would definitely do whoever you are. I'm talking to everybody out there. If you get a new LED light, I highly recommend doing some research, uh, research that particular light, find out how far they recommend you put that plant or that light from your canopy and then go a little bit further and then also reduce the intensity a little bit more than they recommend. Like we've seen here, these plants, they've taken too much light. They will start to burn. The leaves will start to crisp up. They'll turn purple. They will slow down the growth. Uh, things will go wrong. If you get too much light, uh, the leaves crisp up and you can't fix that. If you're not getting enough light, the plants will start to stretch and get a little bit extended. We can turn up the light and fix that more easily than we can take back the crispy leaf. So start lower and slowly ramp yourself up. That's going to be something we talk about here toward the end of this message. Uh, it does go on. It says, uh, I did spend a bunch of money. Did I spend a bunch of money on the wrong light? Also, is there a strategy I can use for the remaining four weeks that will allow, will allow me to increase the intensity setting on the light? For my next grow, I believe I will induce CO2 supplementation. That will absolutely help. Uh, it'll help with food uptake. It'll help the plants take more light. It'll also help them manage a little bit more heat. But then it says, thanks for all you do. Uh, signed from your friend, Soul Train. There is a little personal joke in there that I almost read out loud that is just between us. I cannot share that with you. Fist bump for the funny joke, bro. So our friend Soul Train, you are absolutely right uh, by moving that light up, by assuming that the light was too intense. One of the major questions that you ask in here is, did I spend a bunch of money on the wrong light? I don't think so. I think if you ray, if you lifted the, the light to the top of the tent and turn it down and the plants are small, that intensity for the small plants should work out. And then here's what I want to talk about. What I would have done, it's too late to do this now. This is what I'm going to suggest you do in the future and on future runs. What I would do is raise that light all the way up and turn it as low as it will let you go. That's probably 50 or 30%. Most of those lights only go down to about 50 or 30. So raise the light, turn it down. Then start your seedlings or your small plants down on the very low part of that tent. So you've got as much space as possible then pay attention to the, how those plants are acting. Do you need to lower the light a little bit or do you need to raise the intensity a little bit? Pay attention if they're getting stretchy, if they're getting leggy, they may want a little bit more light. I may recommend lowering that light at this time just a little tiny bit and do not increase the intensity. Just lower the light down so that you can get that light closer to the plants. Then as the plants begin to grow, you can turn that light up just a little bit. I would say turn it up just a, a small fraction, just maybe 5%, maybe 10%, just a little bit as they start growing. Then if you start seeing shaded, shadowy areas in the tent and the plants aren't growing the maximum efficiency, maybe turn it up just a little bit. Then raise that light all the way to the top. And then now what I do know is when I use the Canon LEDs, is that I like to have them about 50% intensity when I put my plants into flower. So I start, I think those go to like 30%. Then I start vegging. I slowly crank them up. They veg a little more. I slowly crank them up. They veg a little more. I slowly crank them up. By the time I go into flower, my lights are at 50% intensity. Then every week or two, I just knock it up just a little bit. So you're going to get 10 weeks in flower in there. Uh, we want to go up to me. I don't even know if we need to go to 100%. You've got to pay attention to the, what the plants need, which is going to lead me into the next part that I want to talk about. But I would slowly ramp that up. Don't go from uh, low intensity, just cranking it all up all the way. I would start low and then slowly over. We've got these plants in there for 100 days. Go from 50 to 100% over that 100-day period. You may not even need to max it all the way out. There's something that we do need to think about, though. Um, we can give them too much light. We can also give them the wrong spectrum. If they're not getting the right color, then that's too much wasted light. But something else we should talk about is DLI. Uh, the plants will take up so much light, and then they will simply have had enough, and they will shut off. So you can save electricity, you can save lighting by figuring out the DLI of your specific plant, the daily light integral, hit that point, and then reduce or cut off the lights to save that electricity and that photon energy. 
Now, there's something else we should talk about. This is uh, the technical way to figure out if your plants are getting enough light. This is going to take some equipment. You need a PAR meter here, some sort of a meter that will read how much light is getting to your plants. Some of the cell phone makers do have a decent app for a PAR meter. However, I would recommend a real PAR meter for this. The cell phone apps are not 100% perfect yet. Now, if you're going to use a PAR meter, we are looking for a range of 500 to 700 PPFD. Now, what is PPFD? This was all this term was all the rage, all the uh, this was the hot phrase. It used to be Terps for a minute, uh, and then it was phenotype for a little while, and then uh, for a little while, PPFD was the the word in the grow industry. What is PPFD? That is photosynthetic photon flux density. What does that really mean? Um, I don't understand a lot about lighting. Let me admit right now. When it comes to lighting in cannabis, that is where I lack knowledge. I know about the plants. I understand the processes of the plants. I understand soil. I understand most of everything that needs to be done to a cannabis plant. But lighting, my brain uh, just doesn't want to absorb that bit of information. My brain isn't interested and my brain's not interested. I just have a hard time learning about that shit. I have a very uh, a rudimentary understanding of lighting. So let me try to teach you a very uh, general understanding of PPFD, photosynthetic photon flux density, right? I think I said it correctly even. Okay, think about this. This is how we measure, say that you've got your light above you. Imagine you could see little raindrops of light falling down. That's basically what we're measuring, how many raindrops of light are coming down from your light. And we'll measure at certain uh, distances from that light to find out the intensity of that light at certain distances. So at your canopy, I would use a PAR meter. And the desired PPFD at canopy level is between 500 and 700. That is the range that you were looking for. Uh, you need a PAR meter or an app or an app on your phone to find that. That is not something that you can do with your eyes. You need a meter for that. So you'd hold the meter right at canopy level and see, is that between 500 and 700 PPFD? If it's too hot, too much light, of course, turn those lights down or raise the light. If it's too much, do the opposite, increase the light or lower the light closer to the plants. The thing is when you lower the light, you get a little bit more shadow area because it's not spreading as far, but it is more intense. If you raise that light, you will get less shadows, but it is not intense. So that's one of the things that you've got to figure out there. So a um, thousand is really high. If you're hitting that thousand PPFD, your plants are going to start showing problems. If you're under 500, you're not going to get that optimal growth. Once again, uh, it seems to me in my studies and the cannabis realm and everything I've looked at online, uh, that between 500 and 700 PPFD is ideal for our ganja plants. So I think you are spot on with your first assumption that these plants are just getting a little bit too much light. Then the second part of your question was your concern that you spent too much money on this light and you wasted all that money on too much light for your space. I don't think that is the case. I think you've got a good quality light. I think if we figure out how far to keep that light from the canopy, then we'll be in big business because that's a quality light. That's a good company. Uh, and I've never heard bad things about that light. So as long as we keep the appropriate distance between the light and the canopy, and we turn that light down to the appropriate uh, PPFD, the right intensity, then we should get that dialed in. Another thing, the main thing I'm going to recommend uh, is slowly ramping up the intensity of that light. We don't need all of the light on the seedlings. They just need a little bit of light. And as they get bigger, then they can metabolize more. They can be more functional. They can handle more light. So maybe wait till they're a little bit bigger to start giving them that super intense light. So my main advice is to next time, slowly ramp up that light and then pay attention to the PPFD. If you can get that PAR meter and measure the PPFD at canopy level, you will be golden, my friend. All right, Soul Train, thanks once again for the great message. Uh, you were six weeks into flower when you sent this. You have probably harvested by now. I'm really curious, how did this crop turn out? How did it look? How did it smell? Have you got to sample it yet? And also, let's get that next crop on track. If you've got any questions, please do reach out. We'll get you going. All right, this next email came from our friend Zach J. Big shout out to our buddy Zach J for the good question. This one goes a little bit like this. It says, yo Rasta Jeff, I just discovered what I believe are white flies and or fungus gnats. The first thing I would do there, bro, is uh, identify if you've got white flies and or fungus gnats or both. Uh, it's very possible that you've got both. It's very likely that you've got both. But uh, if you've only got one or the other, it may be easier to treat for just one if we know more specifically what we are targeting, or we may have to use multiple methods of attack here. But the first step is identify which one you are battling. Are they white? Do they look like a little piece of rice on the stems? Uh, when you tap the pots, does it look like ashes come flying out? 
or are they little black bugs? Those are the fungus gnats. The white ones are the white flies. That should be obvious. Let's identify which one we have got in the grow. Um, then it goes on. There's a little bit here that we're going to skip, but then it goes on to say, I've already ordered neem oil uh, without doing a whole lot of research. Do you have any thoughts on neem oil? Also, does a new layer of all-purpose sand on top of the soil change the way I need to feed or water my plants at all? Much love and respect from Zach. Um, all right, this is a great question. White flies and fungus gnats are very, very common in a grow. They come in house plants. They come in all of the soil. Uh, if you buy a bagged potting soil, a soilless mix, almost anything in a bag from a grow store, uh, whether it's like your local Randy's Grow or Mike's Grow Shop, or if it's Grow Generation or Way to Grow, or if it's Home Depot or Lowe's, or even Target had uh, Fox Farm soil the last time I was there, all of that soil, people want to blame specific brands. I got this bug from this soil. That soil's got this bug in it. Nah, bro. All the bugs are in all of the soil. They are made in different places, but then they're shipped to a warehouse where they're all put on a pallet together, on a dock together, put on a pallet, put on a truck and moved around the country together. Do you think the white flies went, hey, I like I like Fox Farms better or hey, I like Roots Organics better. They went, there's a bunch of places to live. And they went in all the fucking soil and they lived in all of it. It's just all about where that soil came from, was stored, how it traveled, what it got exposed to. Uh, it's your responsibility as the farmer to make sure that there are no bugs in your soil. Anyway, my point is the white flies and fungus gnats, they're very easy to get. They come from all over the place. They're very common. Uh, I bet many, many growers have had them in their grow. The fungus gnats are not that big of a deal when there's only a couple of them. They're just kind of annoying. They're gross. They bug you. Uh, they make the pictures look like shit. They remind you that you overwatered a little bit. Uh, but once you get a lot of fungus gnats, then they can become a vector for disease. If you've got a problem in one plant, uh, those fungus gnats will just move that root disease right over to the other plants or whatever's going on. If you've got a small problem and fungus gnats, the problem compounds. Same thing with the white flies. A couple of white flies, they just look annoying. After a little bit, you get a bunch of white flies and it's gross. And you're like, I've got a major fucking problem. That's just a hint of the overall health of the garden. So white flies and fungus gnats are very common. One of the most common causes of these bugs is simply, well, they come in, they get in. That's They're not caused, they arrive. But the reason they stick around is because of overwatering. They like to be around in that moist soil, that soil right around where your pot drips into the saucer, right around there where there's always that little bit of, there's a dry spot for them to be safe, but enough moisture for them to lay some eggs, have a party, get some water. Uh, feels like the Bahamas there for them. That's where they like to chill. The white flies like to chill just above the top of the soil and climb up your sticks. Uh, they like to live right on the, the stalks of your plants. These are very common bugs. They're very easy to get rid of. Now, the first question, the first attempt here was that our listener, Zach J, thought about using neem. I'm going to cut you off right there. I do not like neem oil for anything. There is no application for neem in my garden. In fact, uh, in the state of Colorado, according to the Colorado Department of Health and Environment and the Colorado Department of Ag and the Colorado Medical or the Colorado Marijuana Enforcement Division, all neem based products are banned in commercial cultivation. We can't use neem in cannabis at all legally in commercial cultivation in Colorado. We can do it in our home grow because we're not regulated, but I refuse to use neem uh, for several reasons. First of all, it tastes and smells like shit. If you get neem on your gloves, on your skin, on your clothes, anywhere, it's going to stink so bad forever and it never, ever goes away. If you've ever tasted neem, it is one of the worst tasting things ever. If you smoke flowers or a concentrated product and it tastes a little bit uh, fishy and oily and maybe a little bit spicy. That possibly probably was because there was neem oil applied to that flower. The neem oil never goes away. It's going to be there forever. In my opinion, I think I can always taste it. That might be in my mind, but I think neem is gross. And also there are many toxic traits to neem. Neem has been banned in many countries for many uses. Uh, it's known to do reproductive damage to men and women, and it's not good uh, for the environment or your body. So there are a few reasons why I don't recommend to use neem. Um, it just tastes like shit and it doesn't go away. And there are better options. Uh, now that I told you, I don't like the product. You said that you've already ordered, which I do apologize for. Uh, let's talk about products that will help you to get rid of these white flies and or fungus gnats. The first thing, uh, step one is let's identify positively identify what we are battling. If we're battling just white flies, I'm going to recommend, uh, just one product. If we're battling fungus gnats, I'm going to recommend a different product. If we've got them both, we may mix up these products together and spray them at the same time. It depends on how 
uh, strong these bugs are attacking uh, and which one it is. If there's fungus gnats, they are in the, they're more living in the soil. If they're white flies, they're a little bit in the soil and more on the stalks and under the foliage of the plants. Two different uh, means of treatment, two different modes of attack. But let's talk about it. Let's identify the bugs that you've got. That is the very first step. The second step is let's stop overwatering these plants. You did address that here in the message. You understand that part of the problem is from overwatering. Let's reduce the water. Also, is there standing water? Uh, I don't know if your grow is in a commercial building, if it's in your home, if it's in a hotel, if it's a train station, uh, if it's in the city, if it's on a farm. I don't know any of those uh, environmental factors, but possibly you've got water standing somewhere else or a source of moisture somewhere else. Those white flies and fungus gnats will be drawn to that source of moisture as well, as well as all of the other insects. They're going to come to the water first. Warm, water, aroma, the bugs are going to show up. So let's get rid of the water, the overwater, the excessive water, the lingering moisture. They're like mosquitoes. They're going to come where there's water. So let's get rid of that. Now, let's identify a couple of pesticides that I would recommend for, uh, let's start with the white flies. If you've just got white flies, I would do a little bit of defoliation. Um, you probably need to defoliate anyway. The white flies are going to be hiding under the leaves. Let's pull off some leaves. Let's glove up. Let's put on some clothes we don't really like a whole lot and go defoliate. Let's just go manually remove a bunch of the white flies from the room and also remove their hotel. Take away their party spot. They won't come to party. So let's defoliate a little bit. Put all of those defoliated leaves into a trash bag that you can tie up and seal and remove from the grow environment. If you've got a fire pit, Put that bad bitch in the fire pit and burn those fucking leaves. Get rid of them. We don't want those white flies coming back. Let's do a little bit of defoliation. Now, here's another trick that you may laugh at, but this is definitely going to work. Uh, I get a shop vac and I put the shop vac nozzles kind of big. I've got a little tapered device that makes the shop vac nozzle smaller. I will smack the plants with a stick. And as the white flies come flying out, I suck them up with the shop vac. They're going to fly directly to the light. Stay right there near the light. Smack the plant. Vroom, they come flying out. You're just sucking them up as they come out. That's one good way to get rid of them. You're going to suck up a bunch into the vacuum. If you've got the shop vac with the filter bag in there, I recommend that because they're tiny. Uh, you want to catch the little fucker. So defoliate, shop vac a bunch of them off. Then at this point, this is when I would consider when I would consider a foliar application of a product called Monterey Garden Spray. I usually don't recommend specific products. Nobody pays me for this. This is the product to use for this. Um, there is a beneficial bacteria in Monterey Garden Spray. Uh, I call it BT. It may be pronounced Bacillus thuringiensis or something similar to that. I'm not the best guy at pronouncing shit, but I can read well. I can see it on the paper. I recognize it. That ingredient in that product is going to eliminate the white flies. In a fungus, it is a fungus that occurs and they bought in the bottom of rum barrels and they've learned how to make a pesticide out of that. We apply that to the plants. It is basically harmless to the plants, but the white flies, they want nothing to do with it. So that BT will get rid of the white flies that will also slow down your fungus gnats. Now let's focus more on the fungus gnat and the white fly combination. Let's say you got both of these bad bitches attacking the garden. The white flies, like I mentioned, are going to stay mainly on the foliage. They may go a little bit into your dirt, but they're going to stay mostly on the foliage, mostly on the underside of the leaves. The fungus gnats are going to burrow down into the soil. So the fungus gnats are going to be down in your roots. So to take care of them, uh, we need to do more than just spraying a foliar application. We may need to do what is called a soil dredge. That is where you take an amount of water, how much you ever water your plants. Usually mix up that much water, get that much water. And to that mix of water, we are going to add 15 to 30 milliliters per gallon of evergreen pyrethrum spray. The product is called Evergreen. It's mainly pyrethrum based. It's a very good product for getting rid of fungus gnats, white flies, and most of your basic common pests in the garden. Honestly, this is one of my go-to pesticides, one of my most recommended pesticides. It is simply called Evergreen. In my opinion, it's affordable and it's very effective. And it is also approved by the Colorado uh, Department of Agriculture, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, and the Colorado Marijuana Enforcement Division. So the product is called Evergreen. I would mix up the water and I would water the plants with the evergreen solution. Again, somewhere between 15 and 30 milliliters of evergreen per gallon of water, 15 to 30 per gallon. So you're going to mix up that water and water it right through the plants. This will stress the root zone of your plants. The plants will show you that they were a little bit bothered by this, but one, maybe two applications of this will get rid of your soil borne pests. Most of anything in that uh, soil will go away. So depending on 
the level of the infestation and the strength of your plants, that would help me determine how much of this product to put in the water. Somewhere between 15 and 30 mils. If the bugs are real bad, you want that 30 mils. But if the roots aren't super strong, go closer to 15 milliliters. You can figure this one out. Mix that up. Water the plants. Uh, then wait a couple of days. Uh, then water it again with this same solution. Do it again. If they didn't look too beat up the first time, do it again. If they got the shit beat out of them on the first try, maybe wait on this, but then water them again with the same solution. That second application should knock out all of the root borne problems. Then after that, I recommend watering with a really nice mix of nutrients and put a bunch of microbes in there to resupply the microbes to that rhizosphere, get everything back in action in that pot. The bugs are gone. Let's get the roots banging. Let's get the roots healthy again. Now, while I'm doing these root dredges, I would also do a foliar application of either the Monterey Garden Spray or the Evergreen. Let's hit the top and the bottom. If we just soak the soil or the cocoa or whatever the plants are in, the bugs are going to go up and hang out on the leaves and fly around and just go other places. And then when all that shit dries, they'll go back. We got to hit the foliage too. So there's nowhere for these bugs to go. Hit the foliage with the evergreen, hit the soil with the evergreen. I would do the foliar spray and the dredge on the first day and then wait two or three days, maybe four days, depending on your wet and dry cycles and do it all over again. Now, all the bugs should be gone with those two applications if it is fungus gnats and or white flies. Other pests may have a little more resistance, but that should bang out your problem. So really quickly, if it's fungus gnats, um, then we're going to use evergreen at 15 to 30 milliliters per gallon. We're going to do a soil dredge and a foliar application. Then we're going to wait uh, three, maybe five days and repeat the process. If it is only white flies, let's just spray uh, frequently with the BT, uh, the Monterey Garden Spray with the Bacillus thuringiensis in there. Let's hit that like day one, day three, day six, and then we'll wait and see how they look. Maybe do it again on day 10, but they should be going away by then. If not, you've got a bigger problem than I realized. Uh, we've got to get in there and make some nuclear measures or perhaps start thinking about letting go uh, some of those uh, predator bugs. Uh, there are plenty of predator bugs that will get in there and destroy your fungus gnats and your white flies. All right, my friend, Zach J. I think I answered most of your question uh, on my notes here. It says uh, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis from Monterey Garden Spray or Evergreen, stop over watering, shop vac. Another thing I wrote down was yellow cards. I'd recommend putting some yellow sticky traps in the garden, uh, some at soil level, some right below the bottom of the canopy, and some at the top of the canopy. That will help you identify the presence of pests. Those yellow sticky traps are not there to eradicate bugs in any way. They are there to alert and indicate the presence of pests. That will let you monitor your progress in your battle. If there are more there uh, yesterday than there are today, you're making progress. If there's more there tomorrow than there were today, they're making progress. So you've got to adjust your uh, your measures based on the progress which you and those bugs are making. It's a battle, and I wish you the best of luck. You're going to win, bro, because you've got technology and me on your side, and you are backed by the Irie Army. All right, Zach J., thank you for the great question. Uh, thank you for the great content. If you have any more questions, please do reach out. Everybody else out there, if you have a grow question, please do reach out. My email address is growfromyourheart at hotmail.com. Don't be shy. There's also a grow help tab on my website. When you go to my website, iregenetics.com, you will find a tab that says Grow Help. Click on there. We'll ask you a few questions like, are you growing indoors, outdoors? What strain are you growing? Ask a few basic preliminary questions. Then we give you the opportunity to type in the problem with your plants. Ask me your question. Let me know what's going on. There's also a space to attach images so you can send photos of the garden. If you need some help or have some questions or something just doesn't look right in your garden, send me a message. I'd be more than happy to help you out. I may even use it here on the podcast for content. All right. At the top of the show, we did give away a pack of seeds sponsored by our friends at SeedsHereNow.com. If you would like to win a pack of seeds from Irie Genetics and SeedsHereNow.com, it is very easy to do so. All you have to do is go to this YouTube video. That's right, on YouTube. This is episode 786 of the Grow From Your Heart podcast. Find this video. The first thing you got to do is click like. Make sure you click like on the video. The next thing you have to do, make sure you click subscribe. Subscribe to my channel. So far, it's super easy. Now, here's the main thing you have to do to win this pack of seeds. Type in a comment and let me know which pack of Irie Genetic seeds you would like to win. And also let me know why you want to win that pack of seeds. So here are the three things you got to do. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, and type in a comment letting me know which pack and why you want to win it. 
super easy. Shouldn't take you too long to do it. I look forward to all of the comments. And once again, big shout out to my buddy Zach Voss for winning that free pack of seeds from SeedsHereNow.com. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys, girls, pimps, hoes, friends, foes, smokers, growers, clone cutters, pollen chuckers, all of you beautiful cannabis enthusiasts out there. Really, I do want to thank you for hanging out once again. Uh, this episode was a lot of fun. I had a good flow going. It felt like a great episode. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you liked it, all you got to do is click that like button. Make sure you click subscribe so you don't miss any other episodes. If you have any questions, corrections, comments, or concerns, I'd love to hear from you. Once again, I think I said this part already. The email address is growfromyourheart at hotmail.com. Don't forget about that Patreon campaign at patreon.com forward slash growfromyourheart. I know that is a lot of information, so everything else you might possibly need is on my website, iriegenetics.com. All you have to do is visit iriegenetics.com. There's a link to the Patreon. Of course, there's that Grow Help tab. There's a Discord link. There's a link to Irie Direct so you can get those beans. There's a link to Seeds Here Now to get the discounted beans. Everything you need, iriegenetics.com. Com. All right, that's all I've got for you for this episode. You know I'll be back next week with fresh new content. I want to give a big shout out to my friend Lemur Priest. And until next time, take a fat dab and give your mom a hug for me. We'll